Now, Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. The time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that we get to celebrate another Christmas where we celebrate the birth of your Son here on earth. Uh, we know to every believer who really is concentrating on Christ, every day is Christmas. But we simply celebrate with the rest of the world and we're thanking you that uh, we can now call attention to the birth of the Savior of the world in fact, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray, amen. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to come through the Christmas story, and we're going to come in after the angel has spoken to Mary, after John the Baptist has been born. And we're going to come along here and find that Mary and Joseph are still what we would call engaged, but it's, it, they're actually married, but they have not consummated their married, marriage. And the fact that she is still a virgin and uh, she has conceived of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to break in and give a little history here. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it came to pass, we should recognize that human history is proceeding and that we are part of it. It is a peculiar instant in which we find ourselves because angels do not die. They were created without age. And therefore, the calendar and the watches and the timepieces are... Uh, no avail to them. They do not get older. You see that as we do. But mankind, we're looking at the seconds go by. And what is it? What is it as time rolls on? We should recognize that we are in, in fact, a spiritual battle that is named the angelic conflict. And human history is about something. It is about that spiritual battle. And time is progressing in that spiritual battle, which will end one day. It will end one day. And we've read the end of the story. God's given it to us. God will be vindicated in throwing Satan into the lake of fire. And so we see when, it, when the word of God says, and it came to pass, we should recognize that human history is headed somewhere. We're going somewhere. We are going to the end of the angelic conflict where in fact Satan and all unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire. And it came to pass. So we see that we are in time. And God's plan is moving on. And then we see that nothing can stop God's plan. That it is a great wheel that is rolling and crushing everything that would stand in its way. Satan can do nothing to prevent God's plan from, guess what? Coming to pass. Coming to pass. And try as he may, he would love to stop human history. He would love to stop the clocks, stop the calendars if he could, but he cannot. He cannot control time. The angelic conflict is going to go on until the end. And so we see when it says, and it came to pass, 
We should recognize that human history is about something and that we are in the angelic conflict and that God's plan will prevail. It will prevail. See, there's a point to all of this. And it came to pass in those days. So we're going to see some dates here in a moment and what those days were that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, from Caesar Augustus, that all in the world, that is the Roman Empire, should be registered or in a census. It's funny because this Caesar is actually, uh, that Augustus is not his original name. His original name was Gaius Octavius. He was born in 63 B.C. He ruled for 44 years, from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. And he was born nobility. He was actually the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. His name, Augustus, was given to him by the Senate. He had rejected the names of Rex and Dictator. But in 27 B.C., a decree of the Senate styled Augustus. The Greeks rendered the word Sebastos, which meant reverend. The name was connected by the Romans with Latin augur, one consecrated by religion. And remember that the uh, Latins had leader worship, and so they deified the Caesar. Also with the verb augeri. In this way, it came to form one of the German imperial titles. See, they took this phrase. Meher des Reichs, extender of the empire. Extender of the empire. We recognize that in his reign, he was not that... Uh, bad to the Jews. He didn't, it seemed as though he viewed them with a neutral uh, view and that he left the rule of the Jews mostly to themselves. They were self-ruling even though that the Roman eagle flew over the land and um, in that way the Jews had the security of Rome, but they also had their freedom. And so we see that God put this man in place, and he was giving the Jews a final chance to make some decisions for or against Christ. Now, we know that a census means only one thing. Do you know what a census means? More taxes. And so when you think about a census and they're counting heads, you think about the government is calculating how much, how much tax they can uh, put on you. And so when you hear of a census, it's usually not a good thing. It's not because we're proud of how many people we've got. It's because the government is calculating how, many, how much taxes they can collect. And so you have to understand that the Jews were not too excited about taking a census and that some of them even revolted at the point uh, where they would not uh, take part in it. There was one priest who talked them into uh, taking part in it and he did get the people to mostly submit to the census. In verse 2, we bring in a new ruler. This census first took place while Quirinius, Quirinius was governing Syria. 
And so this man was put in the region to govern the entire region of Syria, which would have run down from what we call modern-day Turkey, all down the Mediterranean seaboard known as Israel, all the way into close to the Nile River. So you're talking about a vast expanse, an area which this man was ruling over. And uh, we know that he was in rule from 4 B.C. to around A.D. 6. And I let you know on Sunday morning that Jesus was more than likely born anywhere from 6 B.C. to 4 B.C. And so you see that this time period does fit. I wanted to uh, give you a little more history and I found something very interesting. I told you Sunday morning that, the, that Israel was under the fourth cycle of discipline when Jesus was born. That means that a foreign army was in the land. The fourth cycle of discipline includes a foreign, arm, a foreign occupation, if you will. Well, this is about the best it could be to have a foreign occupation in your land because uh, Quirinius had a capital for his rule. It was called Antioch. Antioch. And we know that that was a pivotal place for the early church. And once Jerusalem went down in 70 A.D., that Antioch became the center for Christianity. And so it's interesting that this man is brought up. The question is, how in the world did the Jews lose their sovereignty? How did they lose their sovereignty? You see, when you lose your sovereignty, your flag comes down the flagpole and another flag goes up the flagpole like the United Nations flag, which we'll see flying in America in the soon future. You see, I'm telling you that we're headed for trouble. How did the Jews lose their sovereignty? Well, we see that they had retreated to the walls of Jerusalem and around 63 B.C., 63 B.C., we're talking about 55 years or so before this story we're talking about. The Jews had retreated to the walls of Jerusalem. And the Romans came and they besieged the city. They besieged the city. And they began to build ramps against the walls and set up their artillery of the day. And they began to attack. And... Uh, there was an interesting uh, piece here written that I found about a Jewish historian named Josephus. In chapter 7, The Wars of the Jews, the Jewish historian Josephus says that Pompey, that's the Roman general, admired the courage of the Jews as their city was being attacked. He was impressed that they continued their worship services while the missiles were flying at them from all directions. It was as if Jerusalem were wrapped in peace in the midst of this violence. Even when the Romans entered the city and took the temple, the people continued to worship and die beside the altar. Isn't that interesting? So we see that, in fact, the regathering of the Jews, which we know they spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity, and they were allowed to come back in the land. And we've studied it before in Nehemiah, how they had esprit de corps, and how they got the Mosaic Law back out, and they began to try to function under it. 
from that time until here, we'll see that they came back up and they had revival. That means they brought the Word of God back out. And Bible doctrine was at its zenith in the land. But then they began to slide down. They enjoyed their prosperity a little too much. And they began to slide back and fall under the five cycles of discipline. Remember that there's five cycles of discipline because God is gracious. And so we see that some Jews still recognized nationalism, patriotism, and they recognized the, that there, there should be a will to fight. A will to fight for your country. And they recognized that you have to have freedom to worship. See, there is no Bible class in North Korea. That's because you have to have freedom to worship. So there's two things I want you to remember about this story. The question, the first one is a question for you. If the Romans were building ramparts against your city, would you fight? See, if you see the North Koreans and the Chicoms parachuting into your city, will you fight? And what's so bad about it is this. My generation is probably the last generation that lived through the Cold War and recognized the threat of communism. But we've eaten too many cheeseburgers. You see, my generation has, doesn't have their health anymore. They can't fight. They can't see all tactics require movement, whether they're individual or team. You have to move your body. And my generation is too fat and out of shape. So the younger it's left up to the younger generation. But when they see the parachutes open, what will they do? See, there has to be the will to fight for your own freedom in every generation. Will you fight? The Jews were fighting in 63 B.C. And then the second question is, do you value worship to the point where you recognize you can only do it in freedom? See, the Jews recognized they could not continue temple worship without their own freedom. And even as the Romans crossed the barriers there in Jerusalem, which it took them a while, the Jews were still functioning in temple worship. Amazing. Now in God's grace, even in the fourth cycle of discipline, with a different nation's flag flying over Israel, they still had some personal freedom. And that is the story behind which we see the birth of Christ. In verse 3, we see, So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. It's funny because uh, I'm a Texan, and I was born in Beaumont, Texas. And if I had to go register in my own city, I would have to travel down to the coast of Texas and even though all of my family is living in Arkansas or based in Arkansas, my whole family is Texans. We all have Texas 
on our birth certificates. And uh, if you didn't know it, it's a great point of arrogance among the Texans because Texans are almost like they have their own nation. And uh, if you're a Texan, you're going to make sure everybody knows it and that uh, you're, you're very proud of the fact that you are from Texas. But the very fact that uh, Texas may now secede from the United States is a point uh, that uh, may come to the forefront uh, during the next year or so. And so uh, I'm digging out my birth certificate. And if you were born in Texas, you are very blessed because it may be the only place in the United States that can continue in the free market economy in the future. So we see here that Joseph was going to his own town and um, that was Bethlehem, the city of David. I want to have a flashback, if you will, to the fact that Joseph had learned that his wife had become pregnant and that he was going to put her away quietly, if you remember. And I want to flash back to Matthew 1.18, and I'm going to read to you and get you caught up from Matthew what has happened up to this point. Why is Joseph still with Mary? In Matthew 1.18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed follows after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Spirit then Joseph her husband being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly you see he could have brought her before a public court and had her stoned to death and that's actually what the Jewish law prescribed but because Joseph had divine viewpoint in his right lobe he recognized grace and the fact that if God gave us what we deserved we'd all be dead you see Joseph was just and the fact that he recognized the example of grace. That if we got what we would all deserved, we'd all be a pile of ash on the ground. So in verse 20, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of God the Holy Spirit. He supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in Mary's body, the female ovum. In verse 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you, the father name to name the child, shall call his name Jesus, Isus. For he shall save the people from their sins. Now that's important. Because the Jews viewed the Messiah, first of all, to deliver them from their enemies. You see, the Jews viewed the Christ, first of all, as deliverance from their enemies. But what did the angel tell Joseph? He shall deliver people from their sins. And so the cross has to come before the crown, exactly what the angel is saying. So all this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, that's Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. And so that very name, Emmanuel, is the beginning of the hypostatic union. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, 
did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and she and he called his name Jesus and so we see that has transpired when we come to verse 3 let's go to verse 4 and Luke chapter 2 verse 4 are we okay? Are you following me? I think I'm being okay. I don't have a big audience tonight, so I can't look at your faces and see if you're still with me. Luke 2 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea. Now, this is, uh, I showed you the map Sunday morning. Galilee is in the north northern Israel. And now he is going to have to drop back down into the Jordan River Valley and go south and come through Jerusalem down into to Judea, to Bethlehem. But he has a guide. And it's not who you think. He didn't have a big burly man wrapped in animal skins to guide him. Guess who he had? His wife Mary. She had been there. She had already went to visit Elizabeth by herself. And she knew the trail. She knew how long it was going to take. She probably knew the best camping spots. She probably knew where the water was drinkable. She probably knew where to take a break at. She probably knew where the mountain climbs were. She probably had to stop and tell Joseph, you need to eat something because we're fixing to go up a big hill. And so on and so forth. And so he had a good guide. And at this point, he has to take cues from his wife on the journey because she had been this way before. So we see that into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, <clears throat> both of Mary and Joseph were descendants that were in the Davidic line, and it was important that Mary was of the Davidic line because she is really the only one who supplied any DNA to Jesus. Joseph had no part in it, and so we see that, in fact, Jesus was qualified to be a human heir to the throne of David. Verse 6. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And so we see it's about nine months. And uh, isn't it interesting that uh, they always talk about, well, you know, at the end of a pregnancy, the woman is so ready to have the baby and she just can't wait to have the baby because she's miserable. And the baby is pressing on all her organs and it's tough to carry at the end and that uh, there would be nothing better than to go ahead and have that baby, especially if the weather is hot and uh, you're having to carry this baby around and it's uh, it's it's pretty painful and discomforting. Well, what do you do if you want to have a baby? Well, they say go walk around the block. You know, go out and walk. Or what's the other thing? Drink a bottle of castor oil. That'll See, that'd make anything happen, wouldn't it? If you drank a whole bottle of castor oil. That'd put you into convulsions. But what else? See, go on a long journey and maybe even ride a donkey, if you will. We don't know if there was a donkey there or not. It doesn't say, but all of the stories have one. And sure enough, it might make you have a baby. We find out from the other Gospels that there was no room in town. There was no room in the inns. All of the normal staying places were full because of the census. 
We had all kinds of people coming into town and all the motels and hotels were full. And the bed and breakfast and what do they call the Airbnbs? They were all full. There was no place. And we find out that Joseph had to clear out room in the barn. The bed, the roadside cave, if you will, where the animals were kept. And this is that point of the story where Jesus is born and there's no place in the inn. I like it, by the way, because you think of a king being born, well, you think of a castle. You think of royalty, and you think of having every available medicine, and doctors, and nurses, and all kinds of help, and a lot of hearsay in the castle about she's going into labor, and uh, all of the hot towels and water and cleansing elements that you need to have a baby and that you would have every medical care known to man for a king to be born. And yet Jesus has gone to the dirtiest place there is to be born in the barn, in the stable, with the animals, with no doctor, no nurses, no physicians, no hot water, no soap. A rugged place. And it just so happens that Jesus had a rugged life. And that's why Isaiah, Isaiah 53 says, you couldn't look at him and tell that in fact he was a king. He didn't look like a prince. And we get these images of Jesus built up in our heads what he looked like and obviously we know that Hollywood's got it wrong. But I like the fact that he started out life rough. He had a hard life learning his father's trade. And he would have had a muscular body and rough hands. And there was nothing about him that said kingship, if you looked at the man, except his thinking. And so we see that Jesus was born in the most humble of circumstances. And that's how God's plan many times operates. It clashes with human viewpoint. And so we see it again in verse 7. And she brought forth, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, this word is actually death cloths. I'll go over here. I have it pulled up. Spargano-o. Spargano-o. And it's the word for the cloths that they wrapped, uh, that they used to mummify people. And uh, there's a lot of stories and hearsay about these type of things, but uh, one instance says that the Jews actually carried these cloths with them on journeys in case someone did die. And so it was part of travel necessity in the day in which they lived. And isn't it amazing that at the very point of Jesus' birth, he is associated with death. So he's wrapped in death cloths and laid him in a manger in a feed trough, if you will, because there was no room for them at the end. And so in verse 7, we have 
I'm going to give you seven points on the night before Christmas. There's seven points. Point number one, it, it, it was a night of life and death. You see, at his birthday, he was associated with his death day. It was a night of life and death. In verse 8, Now there were in the same country, same area, shepherds living out in the fields. Now in the Mishnah, which is extra-biblical writings of the Jews, it tells us that these shepherds were not just regular shepherds. These shepherds were in fact the shepherds that raised the lambs that were used in temple sacrifice. And these lambs had to be shepherded extra careful because they had to be without spot or without blemish. In other words, they could not get maimed. They could not get scarred. They had to be perfect in appearance, impeccability, if you will, and that these shepherds were in charge of raising the sheep for temple sacrifice, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Now this is important because this angel could have gone to the Pharisees. They were the strictest sect of Jews in relation to observance of the Mosaic law, the Pharisees were. But they were religious, and they had become uh, those who functioned under ritual without reality. The angel could have appeared to the Sadducees, or the scribes, or the Bible teachers of the day. But where did the angel go? The angel went to the shepherds. And it was perhaps that the shepherds had more of a reality about the sacrificial lambs than the rest of the religious. You see, they raised those lambs. They had they named them. They knew them from their birth. They kept them safe. They kept them without blemish. And they turned them over to temple, to the temple, to the religious leaders for sacrifice. And every sacrificial animal represented Jesus Christ and the violence of the cross. You see? It had meaning. And it had deep meaning to them for they cared for the animals. So it was that the angel appeared to the shepherds. And this should tell us something. It's the ordinary believer functioning in the plan of God that becomes the invisible hero in the angelic conflict. You see, it's not the TV preachers. It's not those who are famous. It's not those who have a big name in Christianity. It's the ordinary believer who executes the plan of God for his life that becomes an invisible hero in the angelic conflict. You see, he's not known by man, but he's famous with God. And so we have the shepherds, and we recognize an important principle. It's the invisible hero that supplies the evidence to the prosecution in the appeal phase of Satan's trial. The shepherds and you and I. 
Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. We should recognize that you can't go into God's presence without being affected by it. And obviously, this elect angel had lived with God for a million years. He had soaked in the radiance of God's glory, and here he is in the presence of these shepherds. The very fact that these shepherds were probably around a fire, each one of them probably had a lamb under his coat trying to keep it alive, thinking about Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb. Now the angel of the Lord has appeared to him. It's many times that way. And I hope that I have the thought of Jesus Christ when I hear the trumpet call of God in the voice of an archangel. And it was about his business as these shepherds were. The angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So point number two, point number two, it's a night of good news. First of all, we saw it, it was a night of life and death. Secondly, we see it's a night of good news. And it should be this way when we're giving the gospel. It's all good news. You all gaily on. It means good news. And here the angel is saying, this is a very joyous message that I bring you. And not only that, he says it's for all people. And I like that because hyper-Calvinism says that the gospel is only for who? The elect. But the angel says what? It's for all people. All people. And you know what Jesus says? Many are called, but few are chosen. You know what that means? Many people will hear the gospel message, but few will believe. And so this angel is telling us something. It's for man to decide. For or against Jesus Christ. He has to make his own choice. And so we recognize a principle when the angel says this. The angelic conflict is about volition. Volition. Man is free to choose for or against God's plan for his life. Nothing is written in stone. You have your own destiny, and it's guided by your own volition for all people. Verse 11, the message goes on. For there is born to you, unto you, this day in the city of David a Savior. So tarry on who is Christ the Lord. Christos, kurios. I like, see all those words he used are very important. A Savior. Soterion, it means the work of salvation. Who is Christ? Christos, the person of Christ. Kurios. Lord, that means God. And this will be the sign unto you. So he's going to tell them how to identify this person. He's going to tell them to go look around, and this is how you see him, this is how you identify this one member of the human race who is the Christ. You will find a babe. And that word is brephos. It means infant, baby child. Now remember that because we're gonna, you know, I'm going to have another word coming up later on. Which is not brephos. It's not an infant on its mother's milk. It's going to be padeon. It's going to mean toddler. You will find a babe, newborn, see, wrapped in death cloths. That word swaddling clothes is death cloths. 
lying in a feed trough. See, my translation is better. You see that? It brings it more to more clarity. See, don't, don't look around for a baby in a cradle. Don't look around for a baby in a onesie. Look around for a newborn baby wrapped in death cloths in a feed trough. And then you'll know. And obviously, this is going to rule out every other baby in the village. Lying in a manger in a feed trough. In verse 13, And suddenly there was an angelic multitude. So thirdly, we're going to see this is a night of heavenly worship. See, first of all, we saw that this was a night of life and death. Secondly, we saw that there was a night of good news. And thirdly, we see this is going to be a night of heavenly worship. Now, this is, this is interesting because in the Greek, multitude of the heavenly hosts is actually a very bad translation because it is the word plephos, which means many, Stratia, which is army, warriors, army, soldiers, see, military, and Huranos. This is their order from heaven. So this is the divisions of the angelic order of battle. This is not some choir. These are divisions of heavenly armies. They have come to salute Jesus Christ as the only legitimate heir to David's throne and the lion of the tribe of Judah the uniquely born one, the Christ. I remind you that the angels didn't show up when you were born. So that when Jesus Christ was born, He emerged from the womb as the unique person of the universe. The only one qualified to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Not only that, the only member of the human race, Jewish in origin, who could fulfill the promise of the Davidic dynasty. And these angels came by and saluted Jesus Christ as the only legitimate heir to David's throne. Plethos, many, stratia, army of heaven, who reign us. I love it. Because in Daniel 7.10, it says that millions of angels stand by for orders from Jesus Christ. And here they are appearing before the babe. In verse 14, I have a corrected translation. The English translation is so bad that I have white out the entire verse in my Bible and have written it back in in the corrected translation. So in verse 14, a better translation is this. Here is the message of the angels from heaven. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, tranquility of soul among those whom God is well pleased. You know what this means? See, which members of the human race is God pleased with? those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And so the 
fourth point on the night before Christmas is this. It was a night of potential peace. A night of potential peace between God and man. Reconciliation. That means you can choose for or against Jesus Christ as Savior. See, it's a potential. And the potential is in you, your volition. Point 15, we've got to move on. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And so the fifth point of the night before Christmas, it was a night of reverent seeking. Now, I don't know if about you, but we're creatures of habit, and it's easier for us to stay in a rut. It could have been very easy for these shepherds to say, we've got to fulfill our responsibility to these sheep. What if a wolf come? What if a bear come? What if a lion comes and wipes out the entire herd? What will happen then? We've got to stay here. See, we're creatures of habit, and it's easier for us to stay in a habit but what you need to recognize is that super grace believers have a quality. And it's called adaptability. They can adapt to the environment in which they find themselves in. And their environment has changed drastically in one moment. The Savior of the world has been born on that very night. And so instead of following their habit, which would have been easier, they said, we've got to break the habit of staying in the field where we're comfortable with these sheep. And now we're going to look for the Messiah. In verse 16, and they came with haste. That means they didn't waste any time. They were authority-oriented, and they recognized the authority of God was higher than the authority of their job taking care of the sheep. And found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And so their reconnaissance mission, they went out and they found and they communicated, and all of them together ended up there looking at this baby in the barn, in death cloths, in a feed trough, the king of the universe. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. He's the Savior. And so the sixth point on the night before Christmas, it was a night of witnessing. A night of witnessing. Verse 18, And all those who heard it marveled. They heard in amazement, see, they marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And the wild-eyed people that you're going to meet on the earth are going to marvel at you when you tell them Jesus is the only way to heaven. The religious, just ask a religious person, are you born again? They say, yeah. Ask them, how did you get that way? Oh, they've got some wild answer. In verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her right lobe. She had doctrine circulating in the right lobe of her mentality. And she took all of these things that had happened. And she is making them match. 
Remember all of those prophecies we went over about the birth of Jesus Christ? She's connecting the dots. Putting these things together in her mind. Verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. And so point number seven of the night before Christmas, it was a night of quiet meditation. Mary revolved these things in her stream of consciousness and these shepherds, they circulated it within themselves, these truths they had found out. Well, I didn't get to cover the entire Christmas story. And we come right down to the end of the service, and so my challenge is this. We're in the angelic conflict, and time is coming to pass. And just like the Jews of their day in the birth of Jesus Christ, we may in fact see the Lord not in a manger, not in a barn, not in a feed trough, but in the clouds. The question is, as the Jews of the days of the birth of Christ, they see the shepherds were ready to receive a Savior. They were the minority. My question for you, as the shepherds were ready to receive the Savior of the world, are you ready to meet Him in the clouds? You see, will be pondering the thoughts of Christ at his return? And that's a question only you and I can answer for ourselves. Well, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance.